portion of God's word that we'll focus our hearts on this morning on the Saints' Triumphant Sunday comes from Luke chapter 20. Let's begin with prayer. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I heard a great story recently. I can't for the life of me remember who told it to me, so if it was one of you, consider this my apology for not properly citing my sources. There's a story about a a young family, and the young parents had informed their young children that their Christmas gift this year was going to be a trip to Disney World in a few months. And as the weeks passed by in eager anticipation, the parents kept stoking the fire for the kids, telling them how exciting and fun and magical Disney World was going to be and how much they were going to love it, until they were at a, a fever pitch, ready to go, until the day finally came, Disney Day, The family piled into the van in the early morning darkness to to drive over to the Magic Kingdom. And the parents ensured the little children that when they woke up, they were going to be at Disney World. About an hour outside of Orlando, they had to stop for gas, went inside for a potty break and to get some snacks. About 15 minutes in the store, they made their way back out, hopped back in the van and got ready for their final leg of the drive. And the mom looked in the rearview mirror at the kids in the back seat And she noticed that their youngest son had a a strange look on his face, kind of a mixture of of excitement, but also some some sadness, disappointment, and confusion. And she asked him what was going on, why he looked like that. And he slowly said, asked, Mom, was that Disney World? She laughed, a sympathetic laugh, and assured him that no, their experience at Magic Kingdom was going to be far more magical and more joyful than their trip to the gas station. (laughs) See, that little boy, though, he he didn't know what exactly to expect in Disney World. And so his, his grasp, his understanding of the kind of joy that he would look forward to there, it was too small. You see, don't get me wrong, I love a good road trip gas station snack break. And if you've ever gone to a a Bucky's or anyone from the Midwest to a quick trip, you know that can be a pretty magical experience. But I think if that boy thought that the the gas station joy he'd experienced was the absolute peak apex of joy that he could have, he'd miss out on a whole lot of joy at the most magical place on earth, right? Today is Saints Triumph and Sunday. It's a day that we rejoice in and celebrate and give thanks to God for all those who have finish their earthly race of this earthly life and across the finish line into eternal life in heaven with Jesus. It's a day to celebrate, a day to rejoice, a day to give thanks. But, but I wonder if sometimes our grasp of the kind of joy of heaven that our saints triumphant and that we will someday get to experience, I wonder if it's also a little bit too small. You see, oftentimes when a, a Christian dies, People will comfort their family and friends by saying things like, well, you know, at least they're back with fill-in-the-blank of a spouse or a a close family member. Or at least they're no longer in in any pain or suffering. and At least you'll get to see them again someday. And those things are all true. But I wonder if, if that's our picture of the fullest joys of heaven, I wonder if our grasp is just a little bit too small that we lose sight of the fullest and truest joy of heaven and what it really is all about. And so, let's let God's word today fill us in. Let's let God's word give us the full picture of the fullest joy that the saints triumphant are experiencing and that all those who believe in Jesus will get to experience. Let that fill your heart with peace as as you miss the saints triumphant but also let it fill your heart with eager anticipation and joy as we look forward to the day when we too will get to experience the joys of heaven that they're experiencing. In our sermon text, when we find Jesus, he's drawing closer to his own death too. See, after his triumphant riding into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, his enemies ramped up their efforts that much more. They decided they needed to work that much harder to try and trick him into saying something they could use to accuse him or something they could use to sort of downplay him to his followers. You see these Sadducees, as they're called, that's exactly what they're trying to do in our sermon text. 
The Sadducees, they're one of the two main religious groups of the Israelites. They're kind of the opposite and the enemy group from the Pharisees that we hear a lot about. We're told that the, the Sadducees, they say there is no resurrection. They didn't believe in a bodily resurrection. They didn't believe that there is an afterlife. And so when they bring this question to Jesus, this hypothetical that they bring, it's pretty clear what exactly they're trying to do. They ask Jesus, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife with no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first one married a woman and died childless. The second and then the third married her, and in the same way the seven died, leaving no children. Finally, the woman died too. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be, since the seven were married to her? Because we know what they didn't believe in, this preposterous hypothetical scenario that they bring forward is very obviously an attempt to make the idea of the resurrection and the afterlife look downright ridiculous. And for them to try and make it seem like Jesus was also therefore ridiculous if he believed in something like the resurrection or the afterlife. Now that you maybe caught it in the reading, the Sadducees make a reference to what Moses wrote for us. And what they're referring to there is a societal law that God had set down for the Israelites to follow called the, the Leveret Law. And what the Leveret Law basically said was if a, pers- a man was married and he died without having any children, it was required that his brother would then marry the widow And if they produced any sons, the first son would then take on the the dead brother's family name and his family line and and continue it that way. And in a society where a person's family line and their legacy was vitally important, and in a culture where a woman was very much dependent on her husband or on her sons to be provided for, through this Leveret Law, God is ensuring that A, a person's name wasn't going to be erased from the history of Israel, and B, that these vulnerable widows would be protected and taken care of. We see that these Sadducees, as they're, they're crafting their hypothetical scenario, A, first of all, it's, it's ridiculous, right? They say this leveret scenario, it happens to all seven of the brothers. That's not going to happen, right? And if it did happen, they probably should have had like a true crime investigation on this lady who had seven dead husbands. But although the, the Sadducees say it, and they pose the question out of mockery in, and out of sarcasm and skepticism, I think what they say gives an insight into the way that a lot of people think about eternal life. See, a lot of people assume that eternal life in heaven is basically just going to be a continuation of earthly life, the same kind of relationships that we have here on earth, just, just a whole lot better. See, like we said, a lot of times people take their comfort when a a loved one dies by thinking, well, someday I'm going to be back with my spouse again. We comfort people and say, she's waiting for you in heaven. And and that's true. But is it the fullest joy? See, if we think that the fullest joy of heaven is going to be just a continuation of the relationships that we have on earth, I wonder if we sometimes get caught up in sort of a gas station joy view of heaven. It's a good thing. But is there better joy that can be had? See, Jesus, he doesn't even answer their hypothetical scenario because he doesn't have to. Instead, he just tells them the truth about eternal life. He says, the people of of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage. Wait a minute. (laughs) That doesn't sound all that joyful, right? A couple can be married on earth for 60 years and they get to heaven and and they're not married anymore? What's that all about? And maybe that thought makes you angry. Maybe that thought breaks your heart. Because a lot of people take a whole lot of comfort in the fact that they're going to be reunited with their spouse someday in heaven. So Jesus saying this feels a lot more like a punch to the gut than the assurance of the fullest grasp of joy that we can have. I think to understand what Jesus is saying here and why it doesn't need to break our hearts, we we need to be reminded of what exactly the purpose and the blessings of marriage are that God gives to us. We summarize those sometimes with three C's, three words that start with the letter C. The first C that we talk about is children. 
Through marriage, God brings forth children, the ability to, to produce the next generation, as we said, to carry on the, the family line and the legacy and, and to support a person's livelihood. And children are a blessing. And yet, Jesus tells us that those in heaven can no longer die, for they are like the angels. Just a side note, right? They're like the angels, not they are angels. Like the angels in the fact that they're immortal, they don't die, and that they aren't given in marriage in heaven. They're like the angels, they don't die. And so in heaven, we won't need that blessing of being able to bring forth the next generation to carry on our legacy, because in heaven, we're not going to die. We'll live forever. The second C is, is chastity, or sexual purity. See, in marriage, God gives us the great gift and blessing of sexual pleasure, and he gives us the ability to, to carry out our sexual desires in a God-pleasing fashion, in, in a good way, a way that's pleasing to God. And yet in heaven, we're not going to need that gift anymore. Because in heaven, our desires and our thoughts and our attitudes are going to be perfectly God-pleasing at all times. Because sin is going to be gone. And simply by the fact of being in heaven, we are going to be filled with more peace and more pleasure and more joy that never ends and never decreases, simply just by being in heaven. And the third C is companionship. See, in marriage, God blesses husbands and wives with the kind of relationship, a kind of unity and bond that no other relationship in this world can possibly measure up to. That's an incredible blessing. And if we're honest, it's probably one of the main reasons that that spouse who has a saint triumphant spouse in heaven is looking forward to being reunited is they miss their best friend. And that's not bad. That's understandable. It's a good thing to love that person that was your spouse and look forward to seeing them again in heaven. But is that the greatest blessing? You see, companionship is... In, in many ways, the primary blessing of marriage. That's the reason that God creates Eve for Adam is so that he can have a companion. And so this companionship is an amazing blessing and gift of marriage. But as Jesus says here, in eternity, we're not going to need a spouse to provide that for us. We're not going to need a spouse to be the primary person of companionship and love for us anymore because we are literally going to have a perfect relationship of companionship and love with every single person who's in heaven. Whether it's a, a complete stranger that you never met for a single second of your life on earth. Whether it's your worst enemy while you were on earth. Whether it's a, the classmate or the coworker that drives you up a wall. You're going to have a perfectly loving relationship and companionship with every single one of those people. And the truth is, you're going to have a perfectly loving companionship and relationship with your spouse as well. For the first time in your time together, in heaven you will be able to perfectly love your spouse because only there sin is gone. Now it sounds impossible, but in heaven you are going to have a more perfect, a more pleasurable, a more compassionate and connected relationship with every single person, even your worst earthly enemy, than you have with your earthly spouse on your very best day. It's hard for us to comprehend because it's, it's beyond our understanding. It's beyond our, our experience, right? For us, that marriage relationship is the highest of highs. And yet God tells us that every single relationship that we have on this earth is it's plagued by sin. And so even your greatest, your best relationship in this life still is filled with sin and sadness. It's still filled with, with unfaithfulness and selfishness and pain. But not in heaven. In heaven, all those things are gone because sin is gone. And all the things that mess up our relationships are gone. And so while we're on earth, by all means, give thanks to God. Praise God that he gives you the gift of marriage, that he gives you the gift of family. Praise God that on this earth, he gives us the next best thing to heaven through those relationships that he gives us. But as we praise God for those relationships, we don't have to get angry or sad or heartbroken at the thought that, that someday in heaven that relationship changes. Because only in heaven are you going to be able to love your spouse better than you ever have before. And they're going to be able to love you better than they ever have before. And you're going to love everyone better and more perfectly than you ever have before. 
as hard as it might be to hear, I think Jesus tells us this truth because he knows what could happen if we didn't know it. If my understanding of the greatest, fullest joys of heaven is that it's, it's based on some person being there with me, where can that lead? It might lead me to say, if that person isn't going to be in heaven with me, I don't even want to go there. Or it might lead me to say, if that person is going to be in heaven with me, I'm not going to be able to find any joy in being there. And neither of those things are true. See, if our full grasp for the joys of heaven is based on people being there with us, then we can easily end up with a gas station joy. It fails to measure up to the fullest grasp of joy of what heaven is going to be like. That takes us to the question, then, well, what exactly is it? (laughs) You've been talking about the fullest grasp of joy. What is it? What gives us that fullest joy in heaven? You can only grasp the fullest joy of heaven if you understand who is going to be there with you. Wait a minute. (laughs) You just said, I know. Hear me out, though. See, look again at what John highlights, what he sees in his vision of heaven in Revelation 22. He says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, the water of life, flowing past the tree of life. A return to the Garden of Eden, an open invitation to once again feast on the fruit of the tree of life that gives us life eternal. The the invitation that was restricted ever since Adam and Eve brought sin into the world. You see, we see in heaven that there is life. Eternal life. The final, unending eradication of death. The defeat and the crushing of of that death that tears our hearts in two when we have a loved one who experiences it. The final crushing of of death that plagues us and overwhelms us with so much ugliness and uncertainty and unnaturalness as we stand next to a casket occupied by somebody that we love. But in heaven, death is gone. In heaven, death is crushed, defeated, powerless forever. And right now, those saints triumphant that death seemed to rob from us are experiencing the fullest grasp of joy that heaven can give because death is done. That's exactly what what Jesus says in our sermon text. It's what he says to the Sadducees. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. For to him, all are alive. See, if there's no afterlife, if there's no resurrection as the Sadducees believed, then why would God say about himself to Moses from the burning bush, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Why would he say, I am, a present, continuing state of his relationship to them, these men who had been dead for hundreds and hundreds of years at this point? Why would he say, I am, instead of I was, unless all those who fall asleep in Jesus live forever with him eternally? And like I said, to grasp the fullest joy of heaven, you have to understand who's going to be there with you. Think again, where does the water of life flow out of? It flows from the throne of God and of the Lamb. The tree of life is again accessible for all to enjoy and feast on its fruit of eternal life because someone has removed the sin that blocked access to it. Removed by the one who, at one point in his ministry, stood at a well and told a woman that she could only drink living water from him. The lamb on the throne who was slain as the ultimate sacrifice for the sin of the whole world, who gave his life on the cross so that there will be no longer any curse. See, in heaven, Jesus is no longer this nebulous idea. He's no longer this unseen savior or this this far-off brother. All the saints triumphant in heaven will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads belonging to him forever. See, in heaven, faith becomes sight. Tears of sorrow become tears of ecstatic joy. Death becomes life. 
and we are children of the resurrection, and all those saints triumphant are children of the resurrection because Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. And so with all these names listed in the back of this worship folder for all the people that these victorious flowers are representative of, today as we celebrate and thank God for them crossing the finish line, to grasp the fullest joy that they're experiencing, don't say things like, oh, they're watching over me, or at least he's back with Grandma Ethel. Those are good things. But there's a far greater joy. The fact is that all those who are saints triumphant are right now rejoicing at the side of their Savior who has made them saints. And that's why one of my favorite pictures that I've seen lately is called The First Day in Heaven. Is a painting done by a man named Carolos Safwat. I encourage you, if you haven't seen it before, to look it up when you get home. First day in heaven. It's a picture of a, a young woman with a look of just ecstatic joy on her face, tears streaming down her cheeks. And she's got her arms thrown around the neck, hugging tightly to someone. It's not a family member, it's not a friend. It's Jesus. And I love that picture because because the first moments in heaven are going to be spent throwing our arms around the Savior who's given us eternal life. The hugs for the family and the friends, those will come later. But first and foremost is to, to love and hug and thank our Savior, Jesus. May that picture fill you with so much peace today and every day as you think about those saints triumphant in heaven with their arms wrapped around their Savior and yours. May that fill you with such peace and such eager expectation and anticipation of the day when we will also be there with them at our Savior's side with our arms tightly wrapped around the one who has had his arms tightly wrapped around you all along. Rejoice, because that's heaven. Amen.